I'm about a thousand times bigger than an ant. And this tree is about a hundred times bigger than I am. So that means this tree is 10 to the third times 10 squared equals 10 to the fifth. That's 10,000, that's 100,000. This tree is about 100,000 times bigger than an ant. Life forms come in enormously different sizes. Let's talk about life and size. This is an ant's head. It has eyes here. It's got an antenna here, antenna here. And there are little segments, little sections of an eyeball called omatidia. Now, to prepare this ant to look at it in an electron microscope, we have to do something to it that is very similar to what was done to Han Solo when he was frozen in carbonite to be delivered to Jabba the Hutt. So that's what we did to the ant's head, and here it is. And now this is the, this is the antenna with the hairs, this is the eyeball with the omatidia, and we're gonna zoom in on the omatidia, and we get closer and closer. And look at that tricorn, I think this is a pollen grain right there. And we're gonna zoom in even closer, there you can see the pollen grain. I don't know what that is, this is probably a bacterium, I think. And then let's look at one of these things, we're gonna get closer and closer, and you can start to see the spots. See this dark and light and dark and light and dark and light and dark and light. And it's real, uh, see, there you can see them again, spotted. I'm not sure what those are. I'm not an entomologist, but it's kind of cool to use an electron microscope to get into closer and closer and closer. Now, we can ask the question, how big is the biggest life? Is the biosphere, is Gaia the biggest thing we know about that's alive? Or the smallest thing? How about this prion? These are things that are like proteins that act very much like they're alive. So are they alive or not? Well, if you're looking for something, if you're looking for something, it's useful to know how big that something is. We're looking for life elsewhere. How small can life be and still be life? How big can life be and still be life? Is there a size range for life in the universe? Well, talking about sizes, this is Gulliver's Travels, written by Jonathan Swift in 1726. And here is Gulliver, and here is a Brogdignagian, a giant human being, and here is a Lilliputian. So there are three sizes of human beings in this one book. And here's another picture, and there is Gulliver, the small one, and here's this giant, um, the king, is the king of Brogdignag. And there's something here he's saying, I'm not sure what he's saying anyway. But there are physical sizes. Let's just consider physical size. Now, without biology, now these are pebbles and they're about the size of your thumb, they're about a centimeter. And let's put the big things over there and the small things over here. And the small, one small thing is an electron. This is what an electron looks like when it's inside of a cage of iron atoms and you use a scanning tunneling electron microscope to see the electron and that's a series of waves. That's what an electron is in, when it's inside of an iron cage. Even smaller are space-time foam. We think when you get down to a size of about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters that it must be something like this, a foam going And then larger scales we're more comfortable with. The solar system is about 10 to the 16 centimeters and then the cosmic microwave background showing us the extent of the observable universe, 10 to the 33 centimeters. And then even further than that, this is a part, maybe of a larger universe that might be infinite, maybe it's even a part of the multiverse, which is super infinite. In any case, between space-time foam and the observable universe, there are 66 orders of magnitude. Now, what about biological sizes? Well, you start out with something about a centimeter, that's a fly, and then you have a unicellular organism here, the two bacterium, and then you have viruses that are trying to get into this communication channel. And then you have a viroid, which is, you can see, that's much smaller than a virus. And then you have uh, genes, and then you have prions at the small scale. At the larger scale, you have things like ecosystems, and you have also the Gaia that we mentioned earlier. So at 10 to the 9 centimeters for Gaia, the size of the Earth, and then down here, 10 to the minus 6 centimeters, we have about 15 orders of magnitude. Life, as usually understood, disappears as we go to either end of this size range. That's interesting that we're comfortable with life here, but when you get up to here, we, kind of, we wince a little bit and say, is that really life? Down here, we say, is that really life? So we're comfortable with life in the middle. There are 15 orders of magnitude between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the 9 centimeters, and humans at 10 to the 2 centimeters are right in the middle. 
And you can ask, is this size range of what we could recognize as life? We're in the middle, but is that, is that legitimate? How objective can our being in the middle be? So here are the physical sizes without biology. Let's add biology, and then with biology, you get 15 orders of magnitude from uh, about here to here. So it's much smaller. 15 is much smaller than 66. Yeah, from prions down here to life, to, to Gaia. Now, let's ask the question, if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat that you had to spend it to help answer the question, are we alone, would you spend any of it looking for nano-aliens? This is something I've asked many people, and uh, most of the time they say, nah, that's stupid. But here's an artistic, an imaginative artist drew pictures of what nano-aliens might look like. Here's an electron microscope of something, I'm not sure what it is. And here's another thing, I think these may be some tobacco mosaic viruses. And uh, one excellent physicist, Richard Feynman, in 1959, he wrote a paper very influential, said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. What he meant was that we're building hammers and machines on sizes of our hands, but we can go much, 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 much smaller, kind of like life had learned to do over four billion years of evolution. It should be possible in principle to make nanoscale machines. Even at that time, we hadn't come even close. Now we're getting close to being able to do that. For example, the world's smallest Starship Enterprise. This is supposed to be the Starship Enterprise. That's what it looks like right there in the corner. And uh, this is nine micrometers. That's one-tenth the width of a human hair. Created by Hoshino and Matsui. Now, this is relevant to something called Fermi's Paradox. Now, Fermi's Paradox is, where is everybody? Why haven't we seen aliens yet? Well, there's 75 solutions in this book to that paradox, and uh, one of them is, well, maybe the aliens are really small, and they're so small that we don't even recognize them as aliens. I should point out, for the sake of accuracy, that this h bar squared over ec should be e squared over h bar c. All right, moving on. Now, life forms get their energy, and we life forms, we get, we get our energy from chemical redox potential when electrons fall down closer to protons. That's, uh, and then there's gravity when things fall in closer to the gravitational field, and then there's the strong and weak nuclear force where you have fission here and fusion here, and you get energy every time you're falling down. For example, hydrogen turns into helium, and helium turns into this, iron is down here, and then, anyway. And then we have electromagnetism, that's what the, our chemical energy is based on. That's what's happening right now, I take a breath. And I'm using oxygen to take, making electrons fall down from the carbohydrate that I ate this morning. All right, this, this is atomic chemistry. Over here is nuclear chemistry. There's an interesting difference, but why couldn't life be based on this type of free energy as well as this, or, or maybe even gravity? Well, this energy that you get is much, much larger, 10 mega <coughs> electron volts, and this is one electron volt. So it's a 10 to the 7, 10 million times more energy, but also it's, it's look at how much faster it goes. There's 10 to the minus 20 seconds, and here 10 to the 13 seconds, so this is 10 million times faster, whatever happens in the nuclear chemistry compared to atomic chemistry. Now, this has been written about in a book, for example, I can recommend Life Beyond Earth by Feinberg and Shapiro in 1977. So instead of atomic chemistry, life on the surface of a neutron star would be based on nuclear chemistry. So to give you an idea of the relative scales, if this gigantic cricket pitch is uh, atomic chemistry, then nuclear chemistry happens on about the size of a person there in the middle. So they imagine chila that are intelligent creatures the size of a sesame seed who live, think, and develop a million times faster, actually it's 10 million times faster than humans would based on atomic chemistry. That's what's going on in your head right now. So this may be a little bit mind-blowing, but remember Haldane. And Haldane said, the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but it's queerer than we can suppose. I'm not sure what that means, <laughs> but it sounds wise. From an ant to a tree, from a prion to the whole earth, 
from space-time foam to the multiverse, how are we ever going to find aliens if we don't know how big they are? If Haldane is right, and the universe is queerer than we can suppose, then we should all try and get better at supposing.